All right, I think um, we're all set. Very welcome to uh, today's NEOS Lab, um, How Will Automatization Change the Job Market? Um, this is an event organized by the European Liberal Forum, ELF, and is supported by the NEOS Lab. The NEOS Lab is an open lab for new politics and the party's academy, and we'll talk about work 4.0, if you will. Um, we have a highly qualified panel today with um, Mrs. Beate Meinl Reisinger, uh, who is the Vice Chairwoman of NEOS and the Chairwoman of NEOS Vienna, as well as a um, member of the Nation, used to be a member of the um, National Assembly and <laughs> many <Marvin> more. Vienna. <laughs> um, to my left is Jan van Kauwenberghe. <laughs> Um, who is a full-time advisor at the um, Studio Centrum Albert Mertens, um, which is sort of a counterpart of the NEOS lab. And uh, to my very right is um, Dr. Rudolf Winterebner, um, who is a prof professor of labor economics uh, at the Department of Economics at the University of Linz. And he'll start right away with his keynote, <laughs> so we can jump right into the subject. Okay, thanks very much for, for the introduction. I'm sorry, I was a bit late due to the, some train delays. Uh, so I hope I didn't uh, cause some problems. I mean, I, I'm, I'm supposed to say a, a couple of words about uh, uh, employment problems due to digitalization, automation, uh, and something around that. And um, how economists look at this is they, they look at uh, how tasks work and then the key word here is routinization of tasks. And basically, uh, one looks at a particular job, and each job has a, a number of tasks, and you think how well you can describe these tasks. Okay? To give you an example, and I have, I have looked at this example, so I have to, to read that. Uh, so uh, a salesperson has six tasks, so to say, and one is labeling, to have, you have to label the stuff, uh, a stock taking, uh, to check how much is there and then what's gone, uh, caching, packaging, to give advice to the customers and to sell. And the question is, which of these tasks are really routinizable? And routinizable means that you can describe the task as completely as possible like in a computer program. So if you're able to describe this task like a computer program, then a computer can do it, right? So that's, that's quite si that's a simple idea. So if you can describe the task completely, then it's, it's routinizable and it's in danger of being done by a computer someday. Or it could also be that this task is in danger of being done by people who do it cheaper. And that could be that if you kind of have people somewhere on this earth and you describe to them exactly how they have to do it, they can do it and do it much cheaper. Okay? And that is why you have some... Uh, uh, companies giving uh, phone advice, uh, if you, you know, ask a company, you call them and you meet somebody who is from maybe India. Because they, 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 there's an exact description of what this person has to do and he or she can do it in India or whatever. So that's the idea. And if you then describe these tasks, there are basically four uh, major tasks. Uh, the first one is a routine manual uh, uh, task, manual work, which is routinely described non-routine manual, which is something which cannot be easily described. It could be something like repairing something, uh, restoring, uh, installing something, which is more difficult to describe. And then we have cognitive tasks. Again, there's the routine cognitive task, and, uh, which is paperwork, calculation, accounting, and many of, of these uh, jobs. And non-routine cognitive task, which is more in, in, in ways like advising something, creating something, doing some innovation, and so on. So, and then you combine these tasks into these jobs, and what people have done in the last years, and they're, uh, they're b people basically have done it all over the place, they come up with uh, uh, jobs and say, what is the percentage that this job is going to be done by a computer in 20 years? And there have been many studies of this. And I think the, it's, it's quite difficult to assess whether this is uh, credible or not, what's going to happen in 20 years. At least I don't know. Okay? It's really complicated to say. 
But what we have done, we have done a study at the IHS, where I'm also a member. Uh, we have um, looked at this routinization, and um, uh, we looked at uh, uh, tasks which are done in, in the Austrian economy, and we uh, uh, checked how these tasks are combined in different jobs, and then calculated something like a, a danger of routinization or danger of automation, and that basically came up with something like 10, 15% of jobs. Saying that around 10 or 15% of jobs are in a danger of being automated or being uh, sourced out from Austria. So, and this is a, in, a, in a way a bit different from, from a technical view, because if you would ask a technician, uh, the guy would say, well, what is uh, basically automatable, what is routinizable? And he would say, well, in principle, almost everything is routinizable. But an economist would say, well, everything is possible to do, but not everything is econom economical to do. So they would come up with different views. So um, what, what these uh, IHS study came up is uh, with this task-based approach. They basically said that, uh, and that's not really a kind of a, a, a ingenious insight, of course. I mean, it's <coughs> kind of well-known stuff what you get out. That unskilled workers, people in construction, cleaning, metal workers are persons or jobs which are kind of endangered uh, uh, to, be, to be routinized, or uh, are jobs which are in, in basic industry manufacturing. On the other hand, uh, from more white color, angestellten jobs, they are people in sales, in accounting, uh, um, um, assembly operation, and so on. So there's a couple of those jobs which are in a, in a kind of uh, more serious uh, uh, danger of being uh, replaced by machines. And uh, as I said, um, there is not much really I can't give you a kind of clear view how many jobs are going to uh, uh, be replaced in the next 10 years because it's a very uh, difficult exercise to do. Uh, but there are some studies who looked at uh, some effects um, in the past and there are some studies who have looked at, uh, for instance, the impact of robots. Okay? Robots is a, is a kind of part a part of the problem we are discussing today. Uh, these are specific machines who are doing jobs which are typically done by workers in, in, in industry production. Okay? And um, a, a, a very recent study f for the US quite recently found out that one a robot in, in industry production per 1,000, well, let me, let me start over, one additional robot per 1,000 workers would put for three to five jobs in danger, okay? And this is um, one additional robot uh, per thousand workers is something the U.S. has at this time, okay? So if they would uh, double the amount of robots, what they have right now, that would uh, put uh, around uh, three to five workers in, into troubles. And they also found that, that wages in, in, in regions where the robot concentration was higher were also lower. So there are some empirical results of those. Um, what else uh, should I say? I mean, one, one other fairly well-established fact about this uh, routinization or automation is that um, you could think about the labor market having three types of jobs. And you could rank these jobs by the, the average income they would have, like high-paid jobs, middle-paid jobs, and very low-paid jobs. And what you find is in the last 10, 15, maybe more years, you find a polarization in the labor market, which means that the very high-paid jobs are increasing in number, there will be more jobs, and that the very low-paid jobs are increasing in number. But the, the main problem is that the number of jobs in the middle are decreasing. Okay? This is probably where most of us uh, 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 are, I suppose. And the, the reason is that the, the, the ones, the very high paid, are the ones who are you know, non-routinizable. They are creative jobs, uh, jobs in, in management and, and, and invention and so on. And the ones on the very bottom are jobs who are basically in service um, uh, jobs. And uh, 
these are jobs uh, which are coming along with very low wages. So we see the strongest results of this in the United States, where there, there's basically no bottom to the wage, where wages basically decreased considerably for the very low, and that led to an increase in, in the number of these jobs. Okay? So this is something which is uh, uh, also seen in most European countries, but not so much, for instance, in Austria. What we do not see in Austria, we don't see this large increase in these very low-paid jobs. And we might want to discuss about that maybe, maybe later. I don't know whether, whether I w should stop here and then let the others talk a little bit. I think if you have something incredibly important more to add. Well, I have a lot of incredibly <laughs> important <laughs> things, but uh, maybe others have we'll, also we'll have, we'll have time important for things, right? Really important um, issues. Um, thank you very much for your very interesting and very concise uh, introduction. Um, and I would like to start off the first round of questions for the whole panel, um, just basically by asking what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the general public? Do we have to be, do we have to be scared or don't we have to be scared if we have to be scared? What is it? Is it a transition um, in the job market or is it a, do we, what's the, what's the outlook? What do you think? Well. I think it's not necessarily true that we have to be afraid because if you if you look at the last decades and even hundreds of years, there has constantly been this fear of technology uh, destroying jobs. And apparently up until now, which doesn't hold anything for the future, uh, this fear hasn't really materialized. I mean, the number of jobs has risen constantly. and. So it might be the case that even though certain types of jobs were, are going to be automated, that other types of jobs will come in their place and that the total number of jobs, well, in proportion to the total number of the workforce, will, will remain constant or even rise. But I think what the professor is saying is, is, is true, that it's very hard to predict and, and that we have to put systems in place to, to, to help and, and, and guide and, and empower the people, those people who, who do lose their jobs and who are left with uh, lacking skills to enter new types of jobs mm -hmm. that are being created in their place. So I think being afraid doesn't really help us from a liberal point of view. We have to make sure that there are systems in place so that whatever happens, we are, we are prepared. I think that's mm. what I would answer to that. Yes, I would totally agree, and I want to begin uh, to say, like um, you, you, you said in, uh, in your um, in your statement that you look at the things uh, how, li like economics, look at the things uh, from a very um, detailed and uh, uh, describing way. Uh, of course, politicians are always forced to look at the things in a more empathical way because it always affects people. What we are talking about, so. Um, I totally understand that everything we are talking now on a describing um, way is um, actually affecting people's lives and um, also more to that are threatening some people because um, I totally understand that uh, in a world that is globalized, that is digitalized, that is more and more um, uh, volatile in some ways, people fear um, of all the changes that are coming um, and especially people who, are, who feel that they are not well prepared. So, first of all, yes, I understand that there are some fears and um, also concerns um, in the society and especially in people who are probably not that well educated. Um, that's my first uh, uh, statement. But the, the, the question is, do we look at this development as a problem, as you described it? This is a problem you said in your statement. Yes, of course, this is one way to look at it from a people point of view who are probably affected. You have to look at it um, as a problem. But I think that we also have the, um, the responsibility to look not only um, at this changing uh, at the, the, the wave of changes in the world as problems, but also <coughs> as opportunities. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves, are we well prepared? Um, are, is the state 
and are all our like uh, pension systems, education systems, welfare systems properly prepared to all the changes that we are facing? And is the society properly prepared to all towards all the, uh, the changes that uh, we are facing? And I would say, from an Austrian perspective, no. Not in, the, not in the areas that I refer to. First of all, education system. I just want to give you one example, one only example, one story, because uh, today I, I talked uh, with a colleague um, about, about turning points in my life, because you always have turning points in your life when you, you stay there and stand somewhere and say, okay, now I feel this, this, uh, th there's something um, uh, big happening now and it is going to... Um, yeah, to, to lead me in one direction. I was, when I was a student, I was giving, I say, tutor lessons um, to, to pupils in, in schools. And I was working also in a supermarket and I had a colleague who had a, a young daughter. She was 12 years old. She was going to a gymnasium um, in Vienna. Um, but uh, they were, the family was from former Yugoslavia, so they didn't speak German at home. Um, the girl was very good in mathematics. She adored mathematics, I couldn't understand. I always asked her, why do you adore <laughs> mathematics? And she said, well, I like to calculate, and that's it. <laughs> but she was not good in German and in English. So I gave her some tutor lessons, and we tried to like uh, really push her forward in German, and also English. I think that English was a problem because of a lack in German, and the way that, is, uh, that English is, is educated or trained in, in our schools. And I also talked to her professor. And it was in 1997 or 1998, I would say, and he said, well, I think that she is not prepared for a gymnasium. And finally, her parents took her out of the gymnasium and uh, they gave her to a Hauptschule uh, in Vienna because they were simply not willing to pay anymore for the tutor lessons. And they were facing uh, the problem that they, ha they, they were afraid that they might put too much pressure on the girl. After some years, I talked to the mother again, and I, said, and I asked her what, uh, <laughs> what, uh, what the girl did, uh, uh, has done after school, and, well, she has a good job. That was the light latest info I have. But I was wondering at that time, with a girl at 12, liking to, like, really adoring mathematics, what could have happened to this uh, young, uh, young girl or to that woman uh, in, the later, in the later forecast of, the, of her life if she would have had someone who had really trained her in mathematics <laughs> and not like being focusing on the, on, the, on the deficits she has in German and in English. I mean, this is just one story, but this was 1997 or 1998. I, I honestly do not remember anymore. And we have the same problems in the schools in, Vienna's, in, in Vienna, and they are not the same, they're even um, increasing these problems. We still know that there, or we, we uh, that, at that time we know that we have too many um, pupils who are, yeah, in a way threatened by their socio-economic background of the parents, uh, because of the background of the uh, educational background of the parents, and also because a lot <coughs> of them have, um, do not speak German um, at home, they will not manage to, to get a, a good degree out of school. So we are not prepared. And today I read an article about Finland. I think that everybody, I mean, it's not new, but today there was an article about Finland who um, now goes the way that uh, they skip all the school, uh, how do you say, Schulfächer, school subjects. subjects. Um, and they simply say, okay, we need to train our children, we, ha we need to educate our youth to be able to face, uh, comp to solve complex problems. And I think that's exactly what we need to do. Um, but we also have to value it as a society. We have to believe in our children, we have to believe in our youth, because they are going to have to manage all the changes and problems we are facing from climate change to digitalization to <coughs> an even um, uh, um, older society um, and also to automat when it comes to automatization we have to simply believe in them and uh, give them the best education system that is possible. Well this is the first uh, just only one example but I think there are many other examples where we really have to change our uh, systems, um, our uh, uh, 
educational systems and other systems, and also the look of society towards some, some issues. Mm. I mean, in terms of fears, should we be afraid? Uh, that was the original question. Well, I think there, there's some signs uh, which... Um, I'm not supposed to talk about politics, right? <laughs> which are You're potentially okay. difficult for policies. I mean, there's one thing uh, you want to ha make policies which uh, 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 facilitate innovation and make it easier to, 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 to uh, form new firms. Uh, that, it, that makes it easier uh, to, to go into IT businesses and so on. But on the other hand, we will see that, that the inequality in the country will increase and there will be more people um, who cannot manage that. So, so the, my prediction is, and, and that's probably also borne out by, by past experiences in other countries, that the, the, the number of persons who cannot uh, do this transition will increase. So there will be now uh, a couple of, say, older people, say of my age, if they, they fall out of their old jobs, they are typically relatively well paid and they have serious difficulties finding new ones. So what we found, for instance, if we compare workers, unemployed, uh, you know, freshly unemployed workers, when we look at workers who are coming from such jobs which have a higher routinization component, that these workers are like 25% longer unemployed. So that's a kind of serious differences. So what I think is that these, these inequality problems um, have to be dealt with and uh, uh, it's also not so easy because uh, these uh, um, changes in the industrial world have also led to changes in politics. If you think for instance in recent elections in the United Kingdom or United States then you can easily see that uh, workers who are going to more, say, populist parties are basically coming from, uh, from, from regions and, and uh, 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 um, parts of society which have basically lost many of their chances. So, the, the, I mean, it's the usual example of the Rust Belt, which is the kind of uh, a big drive for Trump's election <laughs> campaign. And, and this is, uh, you might say this is one consequence of these autumn automatization uh, uh, process in the United States, that they brought uh, such populist policies more to the front. So I think that's a quite serious issue. Um, going back to what, yeah, I wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> to what you just mentioned um, and about education, um, I th personally think this is a very relevant topic in that uh, uh, perspective as well and um, since basically you need higher educated people for the jobs that will open up. Um, how, what can politics do? What can a city like Vienna do? How can we facilitate the transition to run smoothly and to okay. accompany this change? Well, yes. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to make a small remark. I mean, um, yes, you can look to Great Britain, you can look to, to the United States, but you can also look to France. <laughs> and you can see that also there is a possibility of a, ver a very optimistic approach towards the future and giving people hope and uh, a positive narrative that is also working. So I think it's not only um, populism uh, that is the, uh, the answer of uh, like a fear of transition. Uh, it depends on... on on what offer you give the people and if every party um, also ch always jumps on what populists say and uh, even try to uh, make uh, the same statements <laughs> maybe a little bit softer then uh, you will not have this positive and uh, and uh, optimistic narratives that's one thing the another thing is i think that there is a lot more about this the the, f the need for uh, a new um narrative that gives identity then uh, to social um, uh, social um, how you say um, inequality uh, I think there is a, a, a real um, how you say society in the United States also in Great Britain or in whole Europe they need to have a new narrative that is in a way uh, holding the society together uh, that's I'm quite sure about and we desperately are looking for this narrative because we do not have the national narrative anymore but we do not have a European narrative either but this is only just a small re remark I want mm. to say. If um, I can just hmm? jump in if that's okay. Of course yeah. I think what you're saying is true because 
like for instance, in the Rust Belt or in industrialized parts of, of Britain, people, I think, have the feeling that they're being left behind by politics and by leaders because they're seeing their jobs go away or being automated or offshored. And they're, they do, they, I think they have the feeling that, that, that only the, the populist parties are looking out for them or promising solutions, which aren't really good solutions, of course. And, and maybe as, as, as liberal parties, we have to rethink our way of, maybe in the past, we have been saying too much like it's the free market and the free market is good for everyone. I mean, that's still, it's, still, it's still the case and globalization and free trade, it's all good. And also automation and technological process, it's also good on average. But the people, the, the group of people that lose out, I think we have to do more as liberal parties uh, within our governments to, to help those people and to empower them so that they don't fall behind and, and are being left to populist feelings. And, and that's maybe the new narrative that can be part of this new narrative, that we don't leave these people behind, that we don't say the free market works and the economy is growing and there's free trade and on the whole socia society is getting richer and growing. We also have to look out for the number of, of people who are, who are being left behind and, and yeah, not just talk about the average. We have to understand them. We have to, and provide real solutions for them as well, <coughs> instead of, yeah. And I think education to join in with you mm. is, is, is a very important answer to that. Yes, yeah. it's all about chances, I would say. I mean, really, yeah. it's about chances. And I know I, it's hard. For, I mean, you, you cannot go to a 55-year-old who's just lost his job and say, OK, now you have the chance to do something else. I know, you cannot do this, simply cannot do this. So therefore, you have to have a stable and, um, yeah, st stable <coughs> uh, social security system. I mean, it's the only thing you have apart from training um, methods. But you also have to say you are, I mean, you, you have to give respect to those people. But when it comes to the to youth, to the young, of course, it's the chances, and you need it, a, a better education system um, than we have right now. And it starts in the kindergarten, it goes on in the schools, and it, you asked about Vienna. I mean, this the story I told you was like uh, 20 years ago. And just uh, yesterday, there was uh, the new numbers of pupils, um, and I, I I may, I may sound, it may sound like this, uh, that I always focus um, on pupils with a migrant background. This is not true. I think uh, it's, we have a, but we have really an issue in Vienna with pupils from sort, from kind of uh, milieus where you have several um, aspects, like a socioeconomic background of the parents, a low educational background of the parents, but also, of course, a migrant background of the parents. You simply have to look at this, and you have to say what you see there. And uh, the the number of, uh, of pupils who uh, cannot speak uh, German that properly to really take actively part in in the in the training in the in the in the schools is growing um, and we do not have any answer so I mean the only answer we have is like uh, uh, some marketing things like gratis nachhilfe which is too little too late it's too little too late we simply cannot afford to lose like one third of the of the children um, after school who are not capable of reading uh, uh, properly or in calculating properly and the only thing that we or politics at the moment uh, says it's okay, we have some other trainings, we will help you in a way, but they will never have the chance to stand on their own feet. Never. So if you had all the power, what would you do concretely to improve all that the power. situation? <laughs> if you had all the power. All okay. the power you needed to make changes. <laughs> okay. Um, definitely I would start with the education system and I would definitely put more money into the education system. Um, and that means if we take it serious, also to say we want to have a financing of the sc auto auto autonomous schools, or like autonomous schools, where you have uh, uh, the, the director who is deciding um, on the budget and also on the personnel and also on the, on the uh, specialization that is taking part. But um, 
when it comes to special needs of pupils, you have to put more money to the systems. And at the moment, I would say um, that means this like uh, um, index-based financing we need. We have like 4,800 classes in Vienna um, in in the first eight years of school, like from uh, Volksschule to Sekundarstufe 1, um, Pflichtschule, <laughs> mandatory school. Yeah. Um, and I think we need at least 2,000 more classes because I think that in those classes you couldn't, cannot have like 25 children, but only 12. You have to do it. Um, we need uh, social workers in the schools. We need, of course, um, another uh, system of kindergarten where it is just not only like, uh, okay, we, the city of Vienna, we are very happy that you open up a kindergarten. We give you the money because we are happy that we do not have the parents um, on our doorstep um, asking and demanding for a, for a place to put their children in a kindergarten. Um, and we do not, we do not uh, um, look after the quality. I mean, I, I do not know if you know, but uh, it is totally... Um, accepted that uh, the, the teachers in the kindergarten have from a German level the level B2. I think this is not, not good enough. This is simply not good enough. If you don't train the, ch the children uh, <coughs> German in kindergarten, you will not uh, train them in schools. We have really big problems. I mean, there are classes in Vienna where 96% of the children do not speak German proper enough to follow like, uh, what is going on in the class. This is a real problem. We have to solve it. And I think we have to put more money and more efforts into that. From a researcher's perspective, will that help the transition to a more optimized economy? Or, you know? I mean, of, of course, uh, education is, is one, one uh, uh, edge of the population, and it, it will help uh, the young and, and, and uh, the, the youngest. To, to, to adapt. Of course, I mean, if you would spend more money, I mean, there, there, there are many details probably you would want to, 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 to figure out more properly. I mean, for instance, like to have a full-time education for kids, uh, which is uh, not the rule in Austria, which is the rule almost everywhere in the world. And uh, this, I, I heard this is going to come, but I don't really know when it really will come. Uh, and I would say, of course, you would, uh, I, I would also suggest to, to change some of the subjects in school. For instance, I mean, we are talking about automation, we are talking about IT, so I would, uh, I would have, uh, have programs on IT in mm -hmm. schools, right? It's, not a, it's, a, it's a very cheap point to make, right? But there are other, I mean, of course, everybody says, oh, there's so much they have to learn, but I mean, it's not that important anymore to learn Latin nowadays, I think. And there are many other issues which you could cut enormously, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff uh, uh, which you could cut. <coughs> I mean, I don't want to get into more troubles, but, but <laughs> also I would say uh, the training in schools should get more general and less, and less specific because uh, the, the idea is that, that people in their jobs, they will have more different jobs and they will have to, to adapt to more, more different situations. I would also try to train them um, uh, to... Uh, help retraining in firms and help maybe subsidize retraining and, and on-the-job training for, for workers. So I, I would spend uh, these educational money in all aspects, not only on the very young, but also on the older mm -hmm. people. And of course, foreign languages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because this is really a problem mm -hmm. also. <laughs> um, so I think this is one part. Education is one part. Um, the other... Um, the other thing we see with uh, automation, if I understand it correctly, is um, the digital disruption in general, is um, that there is this rise in um, the non-employer business. Please correct me if, if I'm wrong, but there are more and more people um, who are self-employed and less so uh, employed by, uh, by a company of whatever sort. So... Um, what does that mean to social structure? I think you, you'd you be um, very qualified to answer that question uh, in terms of unpredictable wages, social security, and everything that's connected with that. How do we, well, how can we, you know, how can we deal with that? Well, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent that 
existing social security systems aren't really um, made for new types of uh, activities that hover between employment and, and, and self-employment. Um, the discussions about Uber drivers, for instance, is very well known. Are they self-employed or are they employed by Uber? I mean, it's a discussion that is being played out in, in courts now, but I don't think that's the right solution. You have to give a political and a policy answer to, to that question because these people are, some of them are, are doing it full time. So it's their livelihood, but they don't really build up a lot of rights in the social security system. And for instance, in Belgium, it's very dual, like you're either self-employed or you're employed, and there's like two different baskets, and you're either in one or you're in the other, and if you want to be in both, then you pay double taxes, but Are you an don't alien. Really <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's very complicated, and you pay lots of taxes, and then it's not really worth it, and you don't get really much in return for these taxes. So I think the system has to be rebuilt, um, to make sure that people who are self-employed uh, but become sick, for instance, or when they are older, that they are not left uh, with nothing. Um, and I think from the liberal point of view, you have to have like a balance between giving people the chance to, to, to be self-employed uh, and to take risks, but that there is also like a, a, a basic coverage for them for, for when they need it. Um, and also the relationship between an employer and an employee <coughs> should be rethought because you have now these platforms. And it, it's not something that, that should be exaggerated. I mean, there is lots of people doing these kinds of new gig activities, but in the whole population of, of workers, it's still a small group. But still, you have to, to configure your, your social security systems and your labor uh, code for these type of platform activities. And that's really, that's really a challenge. And in my country, there hasn't been lots of debate about it. I mean, everybody can see that it's kind of a problem. But it's not really like a general effort to, to solve it. So I think it's really a challenge for the future, for social security and also for labor, labor codes and labor law. It's obviously the yeah. same in Austria because uh, yeah. there are two different systems like you're employed or you're self-employed. Yeah. If you're employed, you have to be a member of the Chamber of uh, Workers. And if you're self-employed, you have to be a member of the Chamber of uh, uh, Economics, um, mm -hmm. which means that you should be someone who employs people. But sometimes you will never <laughs> because mm. you're just self-employed yeah. and you will never have employees. Um, and uh, it's it's always uh, funny when I when I tell this. Uh, this is, in my point of view, a reason why we, why Austria is facing so many difficulties in doing reforms because, uh, as everything, it is divided by the former two big parties. So you have like here the conservative uh, party that mm. is uh, like uh, sort of uh, the Chamber of Economics uh, and and Commerce, and then you have the Socialist Party. Uh, that is the Chamber of, of Workers, and they have all their areas of interest and power, and they will not, uh, they do not want to lose any power, so mm. they are not willing to to rethink the whole system. Yep. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who are facing difficulties in this area to be employed, self-employed. I mean, there are people who want to, s to be self-employed, but... Uh, have to be, but face the difficulty to be suddenly employed because the uh, the security system, like the, the Krankenkasse comes to the employer and says, no, 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 this is not a self-employed uh, person. You have mm. to employ this person because you say, I don't know. I, I had a, um, a colleague who told me a story. He's an event manager. Okay. And he told me that if he does ev events, like for example in Salzburg, and he has a car, for example, that is branded, and he ha tells someone, please uh, get in this car and drive the car to Salzburg to this event, and then drive back again, then it's okay. Um, this person can be self employed mm -hmm. for this job, which is necessary because sometimes it's more than 12 hours that this event takes place. Mm. But if he says, but on the way to Salzburg, please stop in Linz and go to this address and take up some materials, um, um, then he has to um, 
employ this this person because okay. then uh, it's not possible to do this um, with a self-employed person anymore which means that if you have an event that is more than 12 hours you have to have two persons doing this job and this is ridiculous i mean this is really um with all due respect to the to the uh, to the need for uh protection of workers yeah i think we we simply stick to pictures and stories from the past. Mm. Um, not in all areas, but in a lot of areas. Because uh, these, uh, these new social questions, they come out of this situation, self-employed versus employed. A lot of them, at least. Not all, but a lot of them. So we need some areas to also mm. try things out, I think. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that? If I mean, I, I would just say, just not to, to say everything is, uh, is okay. I mean, I, I would, I, I mean, I, I could agree to, to most of you, you said, but I would say, uh, at the other hand, we need more regulation. I mean, I, I, I agree that there's probably too much uh, regulation in, in, in labor markets in how, how a job is described and what you're allowed to do and what you're not. But I think in, in, in particular in the new economy, there's uh, too little regulation. Because in principle, what, what, uh, what this, uh, these, all forms, uh, base, these forms basically started without any, any, any laws and without any regulation, and they basically can do what they want. Cool. And uh, well, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I'm just explaining, right? So there's, there's a couple of things where I think we need uh, more regulation. For instance, the example with Uber or, or Airbnb and, and also other, other big companies. I mean, there's the question about taxation. So it's, it should be clear whether, uh, I, I, well, I don't really care so much whether these persons are employed or unemployed, but I do care that they pay their taxes. And, and it's not clear as it is right now, because there's this mixture, you know, that you are, mm -hmm. if you rent out uh, your, your, your house for parts of the year, that you do it this just for fun, and then there are no, no taxes involved. And it's, typically, it's not uh, uh, punished or executed. And there's uh, many other issues with, with, with say, say uh, e-business situations that the taxation issues are not clear. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, the European Union is starting to, to look at these, these uh, uh, regulation issues, and I, I, I think that's a serious problem. Yeah. Concerning that, uh, there, there has been a new, a new um, measure in Belgium on the tax system. Uh, also in, in Stockholm, I already <laughs> presented it. It's like a platform regulation on which you, it's peer-to-peer. -peer, so on this platform, you sell a service to someone else. For instance, you cook a meal or you give tutoring lessons like, like you did. And then automatically, the platform collects a 10% tax, pays it to the government, and everything is, is, is fine. I mean, the tax is being paid, everything is in order. There's a limit to how much you can earn on a platform per year. So, and that's like maybe a good example of how you can, as you say, uh, bring more uh, regulation that is, that is justified into those kinds of systems. I but think then again, what for we Air have to do is to do to to, <laughs> to make a level level playing field. Yes, because, because this is I totally agree with yeah. you. Um, yeah. When there are no new forms of economy, shared economy, and it's not a level playing field because mm. one is very much regulated, over regulated. I would yeah. say, like for example, hot hotels and whatever. Um, and on the other hand, the Airbnb is not regulated at all, then it's not a level playing field. Although mm. I must say, it will never be because uh, it's your own <laughs> apartment. Yeah. But uh, taxes should be paid. <laughs> And it's not about regulation. Yeah. I but didn't expect nor. you to say something else, right? Huh? <laughs> I didn't expect you to say something else. That sh taxes should be paid. Uh, yeah, yeah. Pay, always pay your taxes, please. <laughs> so, but yeah. these kinds of, of platform regulations, I mean, there are, like what I said in Belgium, there is like this, so this new regulation, also in Estonia, something similar is, is, is being uh, introduced. So there are possibilities to, to solve these issues. But like on the, on the other hand, Airbnb can't, can't be on this platform because it's not the service that you provide, it's a, yeah, a, a house that you rent out. So, so still, there's lots of more work to do to include these kinds of platforms on the... But I agree that there should be more regulation in some cases. Yeah, but you know what will not function, and I'm sure about that. If you say, like, we have the way 
we think uh, of, of the things. We have our structures, we have our systems, we have the Chamber of Economics, the Chamber of Workers, we have the social partners, we have uh, whatever. And now there comes some new area of economy and we say, okay, then let's try to put it in this, whole, this old system. It simply will not work, I'm sure. Because there always will be new forms of economy that will not fit in this frame. So we have to rethink the frame. This is what I'm saying. Um, you, you, you cannot... You, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, um, deal with Uber or Air Airbnb the, the way you dealt with, I don't know, um, um, tax, uh, taxes or limousine services in the 1970s. It will Why not, not simply work. Why not? Because I mean, you could just start, you know, say everybody who is renting out a flat with Airbnb has to pay 20% tax. Mm -hmm. And if this but guy they have turns to pay out, taxes. Yeah, but nobody does. I mean, yeah, but then I mean, it's not I'm a problem of regulation. Well, I mean, it depends how you call it, right? But, I mean, uh, in general, I think th there, there are so many, many uh, loopholes here in the system. Of course, you say this is a quite, quite different system and you don't want to put it in an old system. But still, I mean, we have to enforce taxation in all these issues. And, I'm and not I against would just taxation. I'm against enforce taxation from everybody. And if they are just you <coughs> know, selling, uh, you know, renting it out for just one week, they will get all the money back at the end of the year. But you're always talking about taxation. I think taxation is not the problem. It's not. It's re well regulation. Tax, uh, regu uh, regulating taxation is not a problem. They have to pay their taxes. Now, <laughs> it's regulated. The point is, um, how do you get the the information? And now this is this has been regulated because Uber, uh, Airbnb is now forced to give like uh, the data to the to the administration. Okay, then that's a level playing field. I totally agree. But what I what I was telling uh, saying is like, if you have Airbnb now and you put it in the old whole uh, old system, you have to ask, okay. Is this now part of, I don't know, uh, the Hotelier Vereinigung and have to uh, pay their mandatory fees to be there and have to ha have the, uh, all the, I don't know, um, security system with regards to uh, fire uh, systems or whatever? I, I know. This, this is exactly what I mean, not taxation. I totally ad agree with taxation. That's, that's no the discussion. I think what we can agree on is that we will have a new system in some sort of way to, um, to accommodate whatever will be coming. Um, I would like to ask you one last quick question before we open the floor to, to the audience, which is um, how will the, this new work 4.0, if you want to call it like that, um, impact the quality of life? Will it improve eventually? Will it improve the quality of life? or? Will it have any impact at all? Um, you know, work-life well, balance. And well, it's, I, I, I would say that's quite quite difficult to say. Mm. I would, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to say it will improve general living conditions or, or make it more difficult. I mean, <coughs> I, I would say that that uh, there will be a relatively large part of the population will which will have problem with a, 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 a more competition for their qualifications, let's say, and that they will have difficulties with a, a, a faster path of work. And there will be a, another, say, large portion of the workforce which have uh, um, improvements in their work-life balance. I mean, the, the people who, you know, they can afford to, to work when they want, and, and uh, but uh, I would say it will go in both directions. And this is what, what I meant at the beginning, that uh, uh, this digital economy will also increase inequality and therefore in the population. Therefore, I think it is important what, what you said at the beginning, that we need narratives to, 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 to bring the society together and then to, to, to address these two different uh, developments. Um, I'm sure you have questions. Uh, we'll start with... <coughs> We'll start with um, the first row. <laughs> <Ladies first yes>. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a microphone because we'll have a, a microphone. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. Um, perhaps one or two remarks about the educational part, and then uh, my question to the panel. Um, when we look at education, and yes, language. Well, 
there are excellent language systems where you can learn a foreign language in four months. The Canadians use it in their schools. You just need specialized teachers for it, so you don't need long hours and social workers and all kinds of other things, but we may need to look a little bit at the education of our teachers here mm. in the first place. I learned German very late and I'm extremely fluent in German. We may need to look more, I think, in education at how we train our young adults to be more competitive. I teach in English at the Fachhochschule here and I'm puzzled at the low level of the English sometimes and I kind of wonder how we're going to meet the global challenge this way. Okay, so I think there's, it's quite complex and it's maybe not just about German and certain types of schools generally. Um, now allow me to be a little bit provocative to the panel. Uh, I've, I've, I thought the way you tackled the issue of Workplace 4.0 in a very 20th century type of attitude, if I might say so, you looked at industrialization and unskilled jobs, and I think if I remember a Mercer study correctly, which, hap which was about two years old, they actually spoke more about um, technology in the field of medicine, and that how, how that is going to make highly qualified surgeons redundant, if you like. They were looking at, yes, robots we mentioned, but not the ones on the factory floors. They were looking at robots being developed in Japan, who actually are emotionally intelligent, not completely yet, but they are going to be in use for elderly care. Okay. So we're looking at a completely different digitalization than we have been looking at, because you're absolutely right when you said we've always had the computer scare. That's been going on for the last 50 years, basically, right? Uh, but the, the quantum leap, I think, that people are seeing in the crystal bowl is something quite different now, and they're not seeing that these jobs are going to be replaced. And hence, the last question is quite interesting. Yes, maybe we will all be working less. It's not unlikely. There are some futurists who actually think that that's going to happen, and that that's going to positively elevate the problems in the social system, because we'll have more time to take care of children and of sick people, and it might reduce some of the pressures we're feeling now. Naturally, nobody knows. It's all a crystal ball, right? But this is a completely different spin on the discussion we've had on, until now. And I'd like to hear comments from everybody on the panel, please, <laughs> about what you think about this whole different paradigm or approach. Thank you. I think we could bundle a few questions, so I think that... <laughs> Um, I think we are in the middle of, of, the, of, the shift, of the shift because we started, as you mentioned as well, the digitalization started 50 years ago and I was uh, myself responsible for shifting workload, for example, to Eastern Europe and, and, and so on in, in high-tech companies. And uh, I think well, I'm, I'm scared and I'm, I have fear because uh, we are too slow and we have to look outside on, a, on, a, on another level. If you're looking to, to China, to India, uh, look at uh, the eco economic development of those countries, then you see what tremendous shift is there going on, yeah? and they are driving us. We cannot wait. We keep for what we are discussing here in Europe, we are discussing this or right or left or some points up and down there, but nothing happened really. And if you're looking actually at the real unemployment rate in Europe, it's about 25 to 30 percent. If we if you take all this in consideration, the European employment rate is uh, measured on if, if you working one week, uh, one hour in a week, then you are employed. This is the definition on a, on a, on a European level and this is ridiculous. Yeah? And, and if you take this uh, down for full employment, or more or less 50% uh, of uh, em employment rate, then, then you have to double the, the, the real uh, published employment rate in Europe. We are ac actually at 25, 30 percent unemployed people here. And on the other side, uh, transformation needs capital. If you transform an organization, a company, or a state, or whatever, you need investments. You need additional social expenses to cover that. And actually, if you look at uh, the, the, um, the <coughs> death rate of the European states, we are uh, uh, on an on average level of 100% of the, the public debt. Uh, 
-hmm. Where should this money come from? Yeah? And we have, in former, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there was this there's I feel I'll there. have to cut you short because we'll have another. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there will be the opportunity to chat more yeah. um, okay. after that. Do we have a third question which we could add to, to that? If not, we'll stop by. Because I thought your comment was very valid. It spoke a lot from what also my thoughts are. And also I was thinking about uh, yeah, what will it do to other uh, regions like China, India, where much more um, labor is coming from, uh, from actual blue collar workers. But my question is just a quick follow up, maybe to, with regards to politics, um, because we have this, this model you were talking about Finland earlier. And also there they're testing this um, uh, guaranteed basic income, which so I'm not uh, a, s a socialist, uh, but this is something where I think this is, needs to be discussed because you can have a great education system and I think agree totally that this is super important and we see what happens in countries like the US where they're not taking care of this. Um, but uh, still, uh, the machines, um, as, um, as uh, my, my, my previous uh, commentator said, um, they are learning as well, they're getting smarter, they are educating themselves and they are getting much smarter than humans at, at some point and they don't need a human operator anymore um, at some point. So yeah, What's, is, is that something that is discussed or that you see on the horizon as well for uh, in Austria, for example? Thank you. Um, who would like to start? Yes, probably I start. Um, I also think that you you are totally right that it's not only the areas of a low um, uh, low skilled uh, level or middle skilled. I think you talked about that it's more in the middle level, but also on the high skilled level when it comes to medical technology. And um, I'm a lawyer. The first question that comes to my mind: <laughs> who is uh, who is going to be responsible <laughs> if something <laughs> goes wrong? So, but this is this is also very interesting questions that we don't have the answers yet when it comes to liability of uh, artificial and uh, liability. Say this half uh, yeah. of artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, you. you we do not have the answers uh, yet, and we have to find them soon. Um, um, and I also totally agree that uh, we are too little competitive. I mean, I know there is always a discussion, it's very hard for a liberal uh, politician to talk about uh, the necessity for, uh, for a competition, but also when I look at Vienna and the schools, for example, in Vienna, um, I sometimes get the feeling that we try to say, no, 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 we take care, do not, do not worry, there will not be competition, we will take care. But that's not true. And the children and the young, they will face it, and they will face it soon enough. Um, and in my point of view, uh, because you talked about what uh, you could skip Latin, for example, I do not agree, but mm. probably. That's but right. you cannot <laughs> skip sports, for example, or, or, or music. So I think you have to find some areas and you have to train young children or, or um, young adults in areas that are not um, simply training on the job, like, so, uh, like for example, sports, like for example, music, uh, <coughs> music instrument. Also, to get to know what competition is about, what team playing is about. I mean, these are key... key um, Components. Hmm? Components. Come on, well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to say uh, key, yes, skills. <laughs> um, how do we, how, how we are going to pay for all this? That's a good question. Um, it will be necessary to cut some costs somewhere. Um, and I think this is one, one reason why we always, like NEOS, always uh, gives examples where, in our point of view, cuts can be, uh, uh, costs can be cut and uh, need to be cut because we do not simply, we cannot simply afford uh, to have a very strong social security system, have a lot of investments, have subsidies in all areas, have the subsidies uh, nine times in all federal countries, nine, ten times because you also have like subsidies. I think. Uh, in some areas, we really have to discuss uh, how to um, how to uh, uh, cut uh, how to cut costs in order to be nest, uh, to be able to invest in the future. And if you ask me, we will have to we have to invest in the in education, in research, 
in the young and we have to cut costs when it comes like for example for the pension system i mean it's like this we have to work longer um in order to be able to to invest in the in the young um guaranteed income i also think that it is necessary to at least uh, discuss these uh, these ways of um of actually being able to to keep our European model of uh, a, a sort of social uh, security system. Um, and I'm very happy that it is tested in Finland. Um, but I'm still very doubt, uh, doubtful that it's going to work. Um, we have the discussions now uh, in Vienna when it comes to the Mindestsicherung. And in a way, this is also um, a sort of guaranteed income, and it is increasing a lot. It's like this is one of the major cost uh, drivers when it comes to the uh, to the budget of Vienna, the the Mindestsicherung. And what we see here is that it's a very thin line to be able to uh, yes, guarantee the people a decent life, also without a job and having a system where it is very comfortable to stay in the system and not uh, taking any effort to get out of it. Yeah? You know, when, they, when you have a system that is like that and you keep the people in the ministry or in the guaranteed uh, basic income and you do not have any... Um, how do say? Anreize. Uh, yeah, to, to get them to work, uh, then it's also a problem. Also, with regards to uh, with the whole society, I think. Would you? I yeah. mean, I, I, in principle, I agree. I mean, with the guaranteed, in, uh, guaranteed basic income system, I think it will be quite difficult. I mean, there have been experiments uh, in the 70s, 80s or so in the United States, Denver, Colorado. Um, they did such experiments and they basically saw that labor supply or, or the number of persons working decreased considerably due to this uh, system. So I'm a, a little bit doubtful whether, whether it will really work. But uh, it is, I think it is, is a problem that, that we will probably face more people who are maybe unemployable because they don't have the skills which are necessary in 10, 15 years uh, labor market. So uh, it, it, it will be a problem. But I, I, I wanted to, to, to talk to the other issues you raised before. And I thought I did raise them. And I, I basically, uh, of course, uh, uh, this kind of super funny uh, and super cool artificial intelligence stuff like search engines and all that stuff. I mean, that's, that's probably really uh, uh, cool, but I don't think this is the immediate thing we will, we will see in, in, in the next years. Okay? So if you go in the next five or so ten years, have you seen uh, wages of search engines decrease in the last years? Have you seen wages of lawyers decrease in the last years? Well, you maybe could know, but I don't think so. And I don't think this is the real future in the five, ten years. I think it's much more in the production, that, that there's more automation in the production system. And, and you have the thousands of workers there. And there's not so many of these really high qualified who are going to automate it rather soon. I'm, I'm a bit doubtful, but we, we might disagree, as I, as I see. <laughs> <laughs> we disagree. Okay, that's fine. So we agree to disagree, right? <laughs> but there is no, I think there, there is no real market for the wages of surgeons in Vienna. I mean, it's all... Well, you see all these private surgeons, and I only yeah. see these big houses. Okay. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> doubtful that these wages are going down. I mean, all I see is just the opposite, that, that wages of you know, top uh, medical people are just going up and up. But, but that's a, that's a, I, I would say that's a minor point. And, and I think also, uh, also it's, it's, I think it's right that uh, probably the development into these new uh, technologies is too slow in Austria, if you look at other countries. And uh, of course it is when you uh, introducing this technology, you have a productivity effect and you have a replacement effect. So the productivity will increase for these firms, so they will be more productive and there will be other firms producing the capital goods, so these will be advantageous things, and there's the disadvantage of replacement of workers. But if we don't introduce it, we will probably have the replacement as well, and not having the productivity increase and the uh, production of these uh, technologies, technology stuff. So it's probably good, and, and what else could I say? I mean, if I have here Austria, 
and a, a couple of other countries all over, and all the other countries are technologically less advanced than we are. So, so what else could I say then go into these technologies, right? Because we have the capacities to do it. I mean, uh, all the other countries don't have it to that much extent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just to add, um, I think what you're saying is true, like also in the high paying, or highly qualified jobs, there are uh, evolutions towards digitalization and autom automatization. But maybe, maybe the professor will agree, there's more of a complementarity between what the, 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 the robots or the software are doing in these types of activities and what the, the human uh, people are doing. For instance, if you have a doctor and he has like a software with a, with a medical database that helps him um, analyze symptoms of a patient, but he still has, he, he adds his own experience to it. Uh, or, or for instance, you have r robo journalism already where, where like types of articles are being generated by robots, but it's like sports articles. Also, there you have complementarity because if these kinds of routine articles are being done by by robots, then maybe there is more capacity for for investigative journalism and 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 more, yeah, creative no, not creative journalism, but you know what I mean to do instead. So I think in those areas there is more of a complementarity between uh, the human workers and the machines. And also, what the professor also said, it's not because something can be automated technologically, that it is economically viable to do so. And a third perspective is that you also have preferences. For instance, uh, airline pilots. I mean, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer my, myself. I mean, you, you can fly a plane automatically and you can already, they can already do it like for 20 or 30 years. But still, all the planes we take still have a human pilot. So it's not only because it's technologically feasible that it, that it will happen. There's issues of liability, there's issues of customer preferences that you also have to take into account. So I think to go back to the, the, the fear that the most lots of people have, I mean, we have to address it, but we also have to tell the people that it's not, you, we don't have to exaggerate the number of jobs, I think, that will be automated in the future, also in the high paying. Uh, and, and then um, yeah, concerning the basic income, um, for, for our party, like the, the position is that, that it's an inter interesting notion that has to be investigated. And so we're doing it as well. And we're doing calculations in Belgium, like what would happen if you replaced all the social security uh, like entitlements and benefits by a basic income. And what you see at this moment is that, and there's also been an OECD study recently for on, on four or five OECD countries where they did the same. And then they, they, they saw that it would lead to lots of impoverishment because the entitlements that you now spend on a small group of people, well, not small, but like a small proportion of the people, if you spread out the money towards everybody and you have like really a universal basic income, it's not, it's not a sum that you can live on. So you, you would have to inject lots of extra money to, to, to have like a real universal basic income on which you can, you can live. So there are lots of difficulties, but, but for the future, it is an interesting notion, but maybe more on the longer term to, to explore. That's how I see it. Do we have more questions on the floor? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I was a bit late. Maybe I've missed the, um, the point already. <coughs> um, maybe it's like for the academics and for the political side. Do we see new patterns of job creation? Like, where, where do we expect, where do you expect new jobs to be created? And how will they be created in the future? Like, do you have, like, what is your basic thesis about it? Like, what should be, like, the political actions and where do you expect new jobs to be created? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say this is more a question to the expert. <laughs> but uh, my guess would be that you would definitely need more jobs and they are going to be there in, in the education system, in training system. Um, so like in, in the service sector, I think, um, when it comes to education and training, there will be a growing number of jobs, but this is only my guess in a way, because I do not know. What I said at the beginning was that I'm very um, positive and optimistic um, that uh, this will lead us, uh, all this automatization, digitalization will lead us in a, in a good future. And I understand that some people are, ha are afraid and there is fear, 
um, but I'm I'm more the optimistic uh, person. Like also in the past, uh, jobs disappeared and new appeared and uh, uh, were created. I mean, I, I, uh, as I said before, I mean, in this polarization process, uh, and particularly in the United States, you, you see very clearly that jobs were created uh, which were very high paid. So in the, the very high paid uh, occupations, the number of jobs increased. And that was for the last 20 or so years, and also the number of very low paid jobs increased. I mean, that's the question, I mean, maybe for the politicians, is whether you want to increase the number of low paid jobs, right? Because I, I mean, want the, to increase the, the number if you of jobs. do want, well, that, that's fine, but that's not the, the question. The question is whether you want to increase the number of very low paid jobs, like in having very low paid jobs, like in the US, or having a uh, increasing the number of low paid, uh, low wage jobs like in Germany. So this is, I think, a serious political question whether you want to have that. Austria is, is more uh, a country where, you know, uh, we don't have, I don't know, kind of full minimum wage for, for everything, but, but it's, it's difficult for, for wages to fall below that. And the question is whether you want to, to induce that politically, okay? Jan, would you like to add something to that, or? Um, okay. Well, I think no. I don't have anything new, <laughs> new to add. I mean, it's it's difficult to to predict where new jobs will be created. But yeah, also in Belgium we have a minimum wage, and um, I think it's 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 difficult. I think in in Belgium and maybe also in Austria we need to do more about rigid labor markets and tight regulations on working hours, for instance. Something you that you talked about because we have very few jobs for low-skilled people in Belgium. Like, if you compare it to the Netherlands, if we had the same amount of, same proportion of low-paid jobs, we would have one million extra jobs in Belgium. So, but, it, but I don't think it's a good idea to, to, to dramatically decrease the minimum wage, because then you end up with situations like the, the mini jobs in Germany or, or jobs in the US, where people have two jobs at two different McDonald's places and they work 60 hours per week and they barely survive. I don't think that's socially acceptable to have these kinds of jobs. But you, I think on, on the labor regulation, you can have more flexibility, like with night work, for instance, or more flexible hours, so that, that you can have more jobs for, for low-skilled people. And I think that's important. You, you need to have these, these people that are, have low skills. For some reason, they, there has to be jobs for them as well. Uh, and that's important, but I think they need to be paid properly also. Or subsidized. I mean, this is the way that Austria is now doing also in some areas. Yeah, maybe with like a like negative a sort of income tax yes. credit or yeah. something like that, which is maybe an alternative to the universal basic income that we talked about earlier. Yes, but I think so, actually. Yeah. I just wanted to add something. I mean, I think uh, we are going to have an older population. So I think this is <coughs> an area where new jobs will will appear, in my point of view. Um, we will have, we have, we are facing a lot of uh, questions when it comes to climate change. So um, environmental technologies, um, everything, or like innovations that help us to protect our environment and to do it not only in Austria, but globally. I think there are a lot of jobs in, in this, in like these green jobs. Um, and uh, I'm very optimistic that uh, that we will see innovations in that areas from young people, from young creative, uh, I don't know, startups. Um, and of course, also digitalization. I think this is a chance. I mean, there there are a lot of jobs uh, in <coughs> this area um, that are n not not yet here. We will we will see them. So you would say the political parties and governments still are in the driver's seat when it comes how you want to shift or how you want to create a new sectors? We you shouldn't create you. sectors. We should train our children well to be able uh. to tackle all the problems in the future and to work in, in, in areas we cannot imagine yet. Mm. Okay. Mm. I think we have time for just one other round before I... Yeah. Okay, my name is Peter Ungvari, uh, Mr. Winterebner. I'm not sure whether I should say that you're maybe you're too. I, I fear that you're maybe too optimistic or too pessimistic if you think that it takes another five to ten years that some technologies will appear. It happens to be that I have been in the IT business for 30 years, and I had a startup um, that I founded three years ago, uh, which was called Blitzcar. Actually, I would say it was something meant to be like a car sharing um, for 
uh, based on, on Tesla cars. So it's something like a Uber. And so I, I have been in this field, I would say, uh, lately. And I, I'm a little bit afraid that maybe the, you don't see the impact which is happening and it's really approaching very fast. Um, um, Beata, we have about, I just was looking it up actually, we have about 8,000 taxi drivers. And I personally fear that these 8,000 people will be unemployed, unemployed within the next five to 10 years because either Tesla or Uber will have automated autonomous cars driving around Vienna. What do you think about it? Um, there was another question in the, f in the first row and then... <coughs> Um, yet to my talk before me, I can completely agree with him because I'm working in the automotive industry and I know that there's a lot of effort um, for digitalization in the car. I'm working on software for cars too and a lot of um, need for autonomous driving. So I think sooner or later it will come and we don't have a choice. Uh, we cannot choose it. E either it will be Google or the BMW or Uber. Um, and I think, um, because you meant uh, we're going to lose a lot of uh, low-paid jobs linked to automation, if I understood it right. I think, uh, and then you um, noted that uh, if politics want a lot of um, low-paid jobs, I think uh, we cannot, um, also <laughs> again, not uh, choose if we have automation. I think it's um, an imperative that we have automation. We're not competitive um, compared, for example, to China or countries that can produce a lot um, very cheap. Um, we need uh, this um, multiplicator of uh, robotics um, to be productive and, and competitive. Uh, I've also been working in the field of mobile robotics um, in Vienna. And what I've seen uh, what was a little bit frustrating is to get funding for research, for basic research, which is, which is not directly linked to something productive. Um, and this is frustrating. And also my question here is, um, what can we do or what can politics uh, do or change um, to, to increase that in Europe and Austria? And um, do you agree that this is necessary? Okay. Well, I could probably reply quite easily. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, of course I'm not an expert in automatic cars, but uh, that's not the point. Uh, uh, the point is, no, no. I, 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 the point is whether this will happen pretty soon or not. That's also fine. But, but still, uh, my general point was this automation is, is a real threat to many low-paid jobs, and this is exactly your example. So, and it's against the, uh, the lady in the second row that, that, that the high-paid and the highly qualified jobs are, are automated away so easily. I, I'm afraid to say so. So I'm, I'm perfectly uh, with you. If you say that this will happen in five or so years, then, then I, I really don't know, but that may well be. But it, it's a problem for, for, for low-paid immigrant, uh, Viennese, uh, taxi drivers, and so on, but not to, to lawyers uh, and highly paid uh, surgeons. Jan? Yeah, I think what you're saying is very true. I mean, the taxi driver as an occupation might very well disappear on the short or, or middle term. And then the question is, what can we do about it uh, on, on a policy level? And I think the only answer is that you uh, provide these people with training and education so that they can learn new skills and enter another sector. I think that's the only way. You can't um, put a brake on, on the evolution towards self-driving cars. I mean, it's, it's happening and there's lots of companies and all the big classic car companies are also investing in, 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 in self-driving technology. So it's going to happen and, and we have to, to be prepared to, to, to not leave these people behind, but to help them recover and, and enter new types of activities. And that, that's what the government should do, I think, and they need to invest in education also for older people to, to make that happen. Um, and, and lifelong learning, which is a concept that is being talked about in these kinds of discussions a lot, should be more than just a talking point. It should be a real policy and, 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 and it should be a real, like the education system shouldn't stop at the univers university and the Hochschule or, or whatever. It should, should go on forever for the, the, the groups of people that need it, I think. I think that's the only answer from, from the policy level.
Mrs. Mandel, rising a one closing remark. <laughs> well, actually, by close, <laughs> it would be. I totally agree. I mean, you cannot, you cannot simply say, okay, let's repeat all the automatic driving cars. It simply will not work. So we have to uh, be sure to make sure to have enough money at the right time uh, and the right institutions to do the necessary training we will need and. Of course, a social security system that is capable of uh, at least guaranteeing a decent life also without a job for those people. Um, if you want to further have the social stability and security in our country. Um, so this is what um, uh, the polit politics has to do now um, for the people who are currently in a job that is going to, to fade away. What we need to do for the future is, of course, to put far more effort to, to invest in research, uh, to do more investment in research, to do more investment in education, because these are the areas where future will, will happen. That's where innovation will take place, there will, where, that's where growth will take place, that's where also jobs uh, will take place. And if we cannot do this because we spend too much uh, money on the past, on our pension system, on our, I don't know, structures that are totally out of the 1950s, um, then that's not a good <coughs> plan. All right, um, having said this, thank you very much again for coming. Uh, we will have some refreshments back there, so we'd be happy to see some of you staying and discussing the matter further with us. Um, I think I'm not saying anything that's wrong if I say this will be put online, if you ever you want to watch it again. Uh, it was streamed and you'll find it on YouTube. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you.